Uh, it is 647. I call to order the Berlin Boils for Region 1960 School Committee meeting. Um, first order of business is we want to add a business item. It's okay with the school committee. Um, approval for a trip to Spain in spring of 2016, which we'll discuss as the business items. Everybody okay adding that to the agenda? Yeah. Beautiful. Um, approval of payable and payable warrants, warrants are floating around. And uh, we have a consent agenda with the January 20th open session meeting. Do I hear a motion to approve? Yes. So moved. Is there a second? I second it. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Next on the agenda is communications. We have communications from uh, John Donahue, the president of the Arbella Charitable Foundation. And, uh, or from Diane Tusseri, actually, mm -hmm. thanking them for a $300 donation, um, which is very much appreciated to uh, John Donahue and the Arbella Charitable Foundation. Okay, uh, we have uh, petitions and audiences related to items on the agenda. Seeing none, uh, next we have reports. There's no student member report tonight. Uh, I don't believe there's a PTO uh, member. So, superintendent's report. Okay, I will be quick. Um, I just have a couple of items. First is the building project update. Um, we used to do those every month. Clearly, we've been in here uh, for two years now. No, two years, right? Lower. Um, so we haven't had to do um, updates quite as frequently. However, there's still some outstanding um, situations, and I just wanted to update the school committee of where we are at the end of the project. So um, we are still in the process of settling with CTA. CTA is our general contractor. Uh, there are still two litigations that are active on this project right now, currently. Our attorneys have been meeting with the building committee. Um, they did that last Thursday. They met with everyone uh, to kind of go over the, the status and the closeout. That was really done in executive session to talk about um, strategy. So that's, you know, that's where they are at this point. Um, we did what they call, um, we didn't, the PMA, um, who is your um, operation managing um, project managers. They actually completed what we call a DCAM. A DCAM is an evaluation. Um, I don't know what the acronym actually stands for. I can't think of it off the top of my head. But the DCAM is really an evaluation that um, in a project such as this that um, occurs. And you have to get an 80 or better in order to pass. And PMA um, scored them with a 59. So they did not pass. And there were a lot of different criteria that they had to follow through with. And I actually want to, um, and I wish he was here this evening, but um, he said he might be a little bit late. I actually want to thank Larry and Dean, uh, Larry Brenner and uh, Dean Palmero because they assisted with PMA in fulfilling that information, as well as Jim McCarty, uh, also on the building committee. Um, they assisted with uh, giving some feedback um, on some of the projects, and, and um, they really, I think, did a fair assessment. They did a great job. Um, and some things we're talking about maybe even scoring them lower, but they gave a rationale with why they right. why they didn't. I and mean, they put a lot of thought into the process. Um, what does this mean for PN, for CTA? I think um, people would want to know what does that mean. If you fail three projects, um, you're scoring on your DCAM three times in the course of five years, then you lose your billing bidding capacity for one full year. So um, we are one district. There was, um, we had here some people from the laborers uh, union. They came out and listened to the, uh, they were um, actually uh, out in the audience during our building committee meeting. And they stated that there was, uh, there were other districts that were actually in the process of doing the same thing for CTA. So we are not the only ones, but we might have been the first ones to submit such, a, such an avail. Um, what we are doing at this point is we have um, some punch list items that still need to be completed in the project. And um, because um, we're still waiting on that, because of a process that happens when you have a project, which is very similar to what we did with the facade, is you give them a 10-day, give CTA a 10-day letter. They have 10 days from the time they receive it to complete that task, otherwise we have to do the job on our own. And so we're in the process of doing that for some of the punch list um, items. And so 
um, you know, that's it for the building project itself. I will say that um, Jim Riccardi also came up to Diane and I and volunteered that if we should have any issues with our sewerage piping or anything like that that we um, had in the past, that he would be more than willing to, to look at it and see if there's anything else. So he's been also willing to volunteer services on um, the project, which has been great. So I don't know if you have questions about the building project itself, but we are, you know, we do still have funds that are being held. We've got our, our van and so forth that we're still holding on to all that until all of these projects, uh, all these settlements are completed and all the MSBA, we get all that big work uh, finalized as well. Can I just uh, ask one question? When we went through the bidding process, what was it, four years ago or whatever, we were required to take the low bidder in CTA. We didn't really have a choice, correct? No, that's not necessarily no. true. Um, you, yes, you typically you take the lowest bidder, but you actually can do references and, re and do reference checks. And if they do not have uh, appropriate references or positive references, you do not always have to take the lowest bidder. Correct? So, yeah. um, uh, so the next topic that I wanted to talk about is the Chinese summer camp. Um, at the last meeting, I had stated to you that this was a, a, uh, something that we'd be looking at, um, looking into, and this would include having um, approximately 30 students from China attend our school here for three weeks. And we have many teachers, actually, that are interested in Six teaching um, for this program. So I did a proposal, which we wanted to know about a cost and a revenue in running the program. Really, our only costs are um, looking at what we would charge for a teacher per hour, because it would be a contractual. It wouldn't be their daily stipend. You just set a set rate, um, because it's not part of their 187 or 186 days. Um, so I, what I did do was typically we do $32, hour, $32 an hour is what we typically, um, if we had a project in our schools or out in some of programs, but because this is a very different program and it's an actual revenue source coming in from an outside source, I actually put in, I um, accounted for $45 an hour for the program um, and having two teachers at each time during the instructional times, and what I mean by that is from 9 to 12. I would have two teachers um, at a time. So two teachers would be from 9 to 10.30 doing English, and then we would have two teachers that would do whatever the other um, STEM-related or <coughs> music art-related type activities, and then one teacher would go out with them in the afternoon to do the sightseeing. So um, with that was a cost of $7,475, and I also looked at um, having 30 students at $1,600 per student uh, would be $48,000 that we would take in, $7,475 we would be expending to the teachers, plus each day um, looking at serving them lunch for 15 days. I asked um, Mary Ellen Freiberg, our Director of um, Food Operations, to give me an estimated cost of what that would be, so we rounded it up to $2,000, um, and then the mileage reimbursement for the afternoon for that one teacher for the 15 days I did approximately $300, it might be a little bit high, but I just, we don't quite know where those sightseeing would be. So our revenues would result, based on 30 students, our revenues would be about $38,225. So that was really exciting once I did this, I'm like, oh, it's better than I even thought. Um, and again, it's more than the revenue, then what we're looking at clearly is the, it's the cultural differences, it's also allowing opportunities, because now we'll have a, a pocket of revenue should our students go to different, um, as part of the global studies, should they decide to go um, to a, a trip, this could help to defray the costs for the trip, and also it would allow us to give our teachers that taught this summer an opportunity for next summer to be able to go to China. Because we wouldn't have to pay for any of the expenses while they're there, we would only have to pay for their flights, and this would be a way that they, we could defer. So if they're coming in here and they're helping us by teaching, it also will allow us to give them that professional development opportunity. And in our global studies, Diane and I were talking today, in our global studies program that, we, that we're in the process of developing, if we have textbooks needs and things like that, and we could be using this as part of that global, um, we can use this as a global revolving account for the global studies. So, 
questions about that or no? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Very excited about it, actually. And we all are teachers included. Um, Mid-cycle goals, I had handed out to you, um, I had actually emailed you uh, the updates on my goals and where I am on my action steps. Uh, the only one was a recommendation that I change the uh, posting of um, the blog to state that I would do that um, 10 times a year, because it really should be more about policy and, and more about uh, budgeting or any types of information like that, rather than the actual individual schools. Um, MCAS results part where we are with those types of big initiatives and changes I should be posting, um, rather than the day-to-day. -day. I leave that to my building administration. So that was the only change that I, I'd asked the school committee to um, allow me to do on my goals. And if, I think rather than reading this word for word, if you have questions about any of my action steps that I've given you, I could answering the questions that you have. Otherwise, or if you have questions a little later on or whatever, when you want to ask me, you can feel free to. Does that sound okay to everybody? Absolutely. All right, I'm done. Julia, thank you. All right, I guess first, the FY15 budget update. In the address, we have where we currently stand. Um, See how much money we have left unencumbered at $295,965. Um, some of that money still needs to be encumbered for different things, and some other money we're investigating possibilities with anything like textbooks um, and anything like that to see if maybe we can do some purchasing in this year as we continue to look at FY16's budget, which is the next item on the agenda. Uh, I included a worksheet which explains what we've been able to cut so far. Uh, as you remember, when we first went over the budget, it was a 9.9% increase. Uh, we've been able to go through the budget and reduce the budget by 128599 bringing the increase to 8.2%. Um, we had some small things like advertising costs, $250, the copy, a copy release, $1,700. Those reductions are just based on um, we're about two and a half months later than we were on the first past the budget, just having better year to date actuals, we can now see some of those are a little bit higher than what things are coming in at. The same with we reduced the substitute secretary salary by 600, um, just due to what we're seeing this year, hoping the trend continues. Um, we took out $1,000 for a webmaster stipend because we no longer have that. Um, $250 for um, sped teacher conferences, um, just based again on what we're seeing year to date. We took 20000 out for our professional development providers. Um, that was the provider, we have the name, and we decided not to. Ken, Ken Tucker has been assisting us, and we've been paying that roughly um, for the last two years to have him um, work with our middle school model. But now we've been able to, we've kind of shifted this year a little bit, and Diane uh, and Ben feel confident that they can continue with the middle school model now after the, after the supports they've received from Ken. So we were able to take that 20000 um, out of there. So will you still have some outside people come in for your professional development? Or it will not be all in-house staff? This is primarily just the so middle that, models. That, that specifically has been taken out typically out of our grants. Okay. This is out of the general budget. Okay. Yes, yes, the entire 20000 was for that consultant over there. Right. Okay, yes. gotcha. All right. Uh, transitional services, we've taken out $1,000 and psychological consults and about $1,500. Again, just really taking what we've seen here to date, hoping that that trend continues. Um, we did get our transportation bid in. Um, we're going to prove that later. But we were able to reduce um, that number by 11150 based on the numbers that came in. Good. Um, we've also got a new uh, the bid came in for our heating oil, and we're going to save twenty thousand eight hundred, which is good. But on the other side, our electricity costs have dramatically gone up this year. We've had to move some money around to cover this year. So, based on what we're seeing this year, we're going to need to transfer that savings into electricity. Uh, we've gotten in our actual retirement assessment for next year for Mr. County Retirement. And we'll save eight thousand seven hundred and forty-nine. 
part of the savings is you can do a one-time payment and save a percentage, which we hadn't been doing, so um, we could do that next year and that will save us some money. And we've taken $2,400 out of unemployment just based on our trends and the fact that right now we haven't, we don't have anyone on unemployment. We took $20,000 out of school choice and $10,000 out of charter tuitions, just based on what the actions are this year. Um, projecting them forward, we think that they will be lower. And then collaborative tuitions, we've reduced it by $50,000. That's due to, in this year's budget, we have about $50,000 left. We're going to be, you can legally prepay tuitions for next year. So the plan will be, we're going to pay $50,000 out of this year's budget and then reduce next year's budget. So all of those items in total equal $128,599. At this point, we're still looking for some more reductions and looking at FY15 versus 16. So we're hoping come back next time with a lower budget as we keep looking. Some of the things from December to February is um, what we've been able to do is now that we're coming, you know, the last trimester, if you will, of, um, of the budget that we use, what we just did with Diane and a lot of the teachers today is we said, look at what you have now that you haven't used this year. And let's see if we can subtract that from next year's proposal and start using this year that you have so that we can reduce next year's number. So they're starting to do that a little bit. The other piece is when you look at, um, I just want to also clear, these changes are changes from the original FY16 budget and not changes from FY15. So this is the difference of the proposal. Um, and then if you look at your budget now, your current FY15 budget, you will see that there is one of the things that we talked about today, um, the actual choice to so the last sheet. Mm -hmm. 20,000 of what those So if you look at the very last sheet, you'll see that in the school choice numbers, which is like right here, <laughs> you can see it on your sheet, but it's right here, and you go down to the gray column, that's how much money we still have left in our um, FY15 budget, which is $20,000, okay, based on the numbers and the adjustments and so forth that we've made since December. So what I've asked um, Julie and Diane today is if we could take that 20000 Put it into that math, the math textbook line where there's 25,000 requests, and they can take this and subtract that out of the FY16. That hasn't been done, but that's just one thing. I want to tell you that we're kind of moving around a little bit to see how we can do that to offset our FY16 budget. So you'll see a reduction of the 20,000 under that math line for the next, the next go around. That will be an additional change. Um, we did get an email, um, and I did have a discussion this morning with um, David Butler, and the select board in Boylston has told us that they will allow a 2 to 2.5% two increase in the school budgets. Um, I have to tell you, I don't see how that's possible. Um, I had a nice conversation with David, like I said, this morning. We spoke about that, and I would like to actually um, request to be on the agenda for both the Berlin and for the Boylston Select Board as soon as possible. I'm going to talk to them about some of these academic challenges and where we are. Um, so if the school committee is in agreement with me doing that, I would like to actually reach out to them tomorrow to see if I could be asked to be put on their, their agenda um, so that they can hear where we are, where we're at, where, what we're anticipating. Um, because I think, you know, if you look at the budget right now, the there's a 5% increase alone is just on our teacher salary line. And so to go down to a 2 or 2.5%, two I don't know how I can do that. Um, and then given our school choice numbers and where we are, if I bring that up at all, um, we're really hurting ourselves for the following year's budget preparation. Because then we'll have even a bigger shortfall following year. So it doesn't, you know, to rub Peter to pay Paul doesn't really help us in that aspect. Um, but we also strategized today, Julie and Diane and I, 
strategize today of how we can actually bring in more school choice in here for next year um, because that's really what you need. And when I look at the trends, and I ta again, I'm talking to David about, um, about the trends in the history. Um, when you had financial issues in your budget previously, it was because you had stopped school choice and stopped allowing additional school choice. And you, you rely on that number and you rely on those funding. So we have to find a happy medium somewhere along the way. Um, so we'll be looking at um, those options as well. But just, just, I know you probably all have questions on the budget. So I'll start talking. Will you be inviting the finance committees to those meetings? Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Do we have the participation we hoped for in the budget task force? So our budget task force, we've been meeting um, a little bit delayed to meet in October, and then we're going to meet in January and then we have a snowstorm. So I did say what I had. I wanted to have at least three of those meetings before the final budget. So Cheryl's in the process now, sending out information to the budget task force try to schedule two more meetings before our end of March meeting. Um, so it looks like one might be either, I think it's, um, I think it's February 19th. Um, I think it's either the 17th or the 19th was the first one that she's been able to schedule. Um, so, you know, we'll continue having those conversations, but we had, we had planned like every eight weeks, but last week got canceled because it was snow. And what was the budget increase that we were given as a parameter last year? Or that we came in on? It was like 1.7. Something. It was what? It was like 1. something. Yeah, it was, it was very low. Yeah, our, our overall budget that we did, um, when you look at all of it, it really was low compared to, I mean, we were below 1%, or 1% or something like that. I can't remember, but it was very low. And the year before that we were seeing it was very low, it was like one percent. But you know, we were able to this last year offset because we had a, such an increase of school choice um, money that we were able to use that additional revenue to offset for this year's budget but we didn't have that for next year. And so that's not helping yet. So but we do want to try and, and I know the teachers were I think um, very active uh, today as well, just trying to look at numbers and where they can try to help to support because we all really feel the importance of having those two additional teachers for next year. It's extremely important. And when you walk in some of your classrooms now, you have students that um, um, some are actually sitting at the teacher's desk because there's no more student chairs. So you have some classes that are really filling up and are not having those teachers. I think Diane could probably express it better than I could. What will happen if you don't have yeah, we, um, you know, our, our state colleges and universities are requiring a um, mandatory four years of high school now. They're also um, years of a lab science. Um, with this, these requirements alone, um, as well as um, our increased enrollment numbers, um, those um, middle school students going up into the high school, you know, we're graduating a class of 63 or 68 this year, um, you know, but the classes that are coming up are in the 80s. Um, and with that already, our history classes as well as our English classes, you know, some classes we have 32 kids, um, you know, sitting in the classroom. And, you know, I think we pride ourselves on um, smaller class sizes. Um, and I think it definitely, um, without us being able to get those additional teachers, it's going to have an impact on the class sizes as well as um, the core electives for high school students. If we don't get those teachers, we then are going to have to pull teachers um, who currently teach, you know, just electives in core, ac core academic areas to teach those mandated um, courses that would meet the, the college requirements. Um, and because we do have such a large percentage of students that go on to a, a two or four year college, um, I think it's imperative that, you know, we're able to offer 
as many um, college preparatory classes as possible. Yeah, so it's a dilemma. I mean, we're just going to figure out what we can do about that, strategize. And so we're trying to see what we have this year that maybe we can use to offset some of next year's requests. But 5% is just the teachers. I can't prepay salaries. <laughs> what, right, but what, how does that, I'm sorry. I'll turn on. Go ahead, Angela. Thanks, Lori. I'm just wondering what of that, if you didn't have the two teachers, what would that percentage be? Because so we put in 120,000 in the salary range, I believe. So we take an additional 120,000 dollars off of what our. I'm not sure we can figure that. So I mean, my point is that if you have this certain set percentage of, you know, this is contractual salary increases, this is light eye blind items that are fixed, this is your base percentage that we're automatically going up, and you can adjust that with school choice or mm -hmm. however, so I think that's important to know. The other comment I want to make to the rest of the school committee and the admin team, and I've already spoken to you about it, Nadine, is a few years ago, we were in a position where we were losing students to charter and choice. And I feel like a lot of those students have come back. You know, you have this shiny brand new school, which is attractive to people in the community for sending their students here, regardless of what happens within its walls. And my fear is in five to 10 years, when the building is not a shiny new novelty, I feel like we have to make sure that we have um, strategic programming in place that makes Tejanto still an attractive place to come and learn when the novelty of this new building wears off. So that's what I want us to keep in mind too. So even though we don't like to make these big increases, I think we have to think about investing in the future to make sure that we're on the cutting edge, sustainable, viable, and attractive. Two. I, I am in complete agreement on the teacher side of this. I think it's absolutely a requirement. My question, what I'm trying to understand, and it's not, I'm not trying to challenge anything, I'm just really trying to understand it. Um, it, it do we have some different increase this year that we didn't have last year in teacher salaries? So one of the pieces that we have, yeah, is we have about 12 teachers that have moved not just a step, but have moved a lane and a step. And that's a significant increase in your, in your salary. So to have one teacher or two teacher, it doesn't show so much. But when you have 12 teachers that haven't just gone from, let's say, like and what I mean by that, for those who don't understand the scale, is if you're a master's degree, um, and you're step five. Next year, you'd be a master's degree, step six. So there's a little bit of an increase in your in your salary. However, if you are a master's and all of a sudden you've got 15 credits beyond your master's, you're now a master's 15. So now you jump over to the right of lane, and you also get that step increase as well. That's a significant increase. And you have 12 teachers that are doing that for next year. So that's above and beyond the regular. And we don't always know, even when, when you are doing your negotiations, we don't always know that that's happening because they have until December 1st to give us notice that they're changing for the following year. And we got all of those requests. Let's see, November 1st, December 1st. I think it was November 1st. They have three contracts, trying to remember, but November 1st, they have to give us, so this fall, we were getting all these notices of these lane changes. I guess when I look at this, and whether it was the 10% increase we had back in December, or the 8.2% increase we have today, those are significant increases, and anybody looking at it would say, wow, that's a lot. I think getting to what um, Angela was saying, I think where we have to start is what is, if you, we were to keep services level, everything the same this current year to next year's budget, what would that cost? What is the increase there? And then everything in addition to that, 
is a choice, is a decision we have to make, whether we want to add more teachers or new other activities. And it's a way to make decisions of whether us, our community, wants to fund those types of things. But one of the tough things is we don't have a clear picture to what's the starting point if we are to main, maintain the same services year on year. I kind of look at that as our starting point, and everything else is a decision of whether we want to add to that so, and invest. So I will tell you just off the top of my head, and Julie will definitely confirm and put that down, but I will, I will tell you that you have probably a 6% is if you were doing a level service, off the top of my head. So you're yeah, talking about big increases. Mm -hmm. It's a big increases in special ed and transportation, special ed and health insurance before you even do anything else. Right. It's about 200,000, 205,000 just for contractual teachers in Paris. So, so it would, so be, that would be without would, adding anyone. I think it would be helpful for us to be able to see sure. all that in in a document, in addition to seeing where you're trying to make cuts. I think it's important if we're going to try to defend a budget yeah. that has this kind of increase in it, we have to really understand what are each of the line items that are the more significant <coughs> increased line items and what options are available for those, if any. So we'll do that for your March budget hearing and we'll give it to you all well in advance so you can ask questions if you want before the actual, because that's our next one, right, is March? Yes. Mm -hmm. Our next region meeting, or no? We can we can do the, uh, the next. It would be I nice, I think, to it. have all that to have you know, a sense of this before we're we're doing the kind of real budget discussions, right before it's with right. the open community. So the next region meeting. The next region meeting is March 3rd. We have a Berlin meeting at 6, and then the region at 6.30, and then the tri meeting at 7. Okay. And then the budget hearings aren't until the week of the and then, um, right. and then the budget okay. hearing is not until the week of March 24. So we've got the Berlin budget hearing, the Boylston budget hearing, and the region budget hearing, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then the following week, is the vote. And then, no, I'm sorry, and then two weeks later is the vote. April 7th is the vote. So, Tom, are you saying, though, you might like to have this sort no. of discussion March 3rd? Well, to see what, okay. yeah. Sure. To get a preview of what these, how these numbers are. A lot of them are in this presentation that we did last time. Most of these are still. We can update this just for the ones that change. Yeah, we but can a lot just of change it, it a little bit. Change a lot of the other things maybe. are in there with exactly what went up and what went down. We'll just change okay. the format of it, maybe right. a little bit clearer. A couple things have been reduced, so we can update yeah, I think that. Last time when we did this in December, I shared my concern yeah. with where the budget was at that time. I think some really good work has gone into getting it lower. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, I think you're hearing from the towns, yeah. and I would echo that, that we, we, we need to work even harder to get it further. And, and so. I have to say, you know, I totally respect the request. I respect what they're saying. My issue is that there's a dilemma we're here at, that we're at right now. And I guess I'm also reaching out to so the budget task force to help me strategize what we do with that dilemma. How do we, what do we do about it? with some suggestions, and not just from us suggestions, but from the Budget Task Force as well. I spoke with Dave Butler to see what he had for suggestions as well. So, you know, um, and one of his suggestions was simply that go to the select board and talk to them directly about these where we're at. This is how we got here. This is why we got here. So not just at the task force, but to them as well. And I, I respect that. I think that's a great idea. So I definitely you know, want to reach out to them and answer any questions or also know where those perceptions are coming from and how we fix that. Can I ask too what's an ideal class size for the school, high school level? I know you have a certain number of desks, but what's what what's your goal or what what's your idea? You know, I, I would say the average 
class size around 20 to 25. Once you get once you get over over that 25 mark, I think it's very difficult. I believe the building was designed for classes of sizes 24 or below, and if the average classroom in a different school would be much bigger, and it's designed for 32 to 35. Mm -hmm. But when we add, we're adding kids at the rate to the high school of 20 per grade. For the last two years, we've added 20 to the ninth grade. Now, 20 to the ninth grade and to the tenth grade. They're going to be in eleventh grade next year. You add. 20 kids, that's a classroom full of kids, and they have to be serviced seven periods a day. So the last two years, we've been absorbing the 20 and then 20 more into the class sizes, which are now over 30 in the, uh, the world history classes, and they're gonna be approaching over 30 in the English classes in 11th grade this coming year because we only have one teacher that services 11th and 12th grade English in those required courses. So these, these classes of 60-something are now going to be 80-something. 68 is going to be 87 in the 11th grade next year. That's a class of 20 kids that has to be someplace seven periods a day. That's a teacher right there. And we're going to have the same thing the following year as well. So we've already, we've already absorbed, and by, by growing these classes for two years now, now we're asking for a chance to get, to get well and survive the next two years. And our, critical. and our science labs, um, you know, the law, we cannot put more than 24 students in a science lab. Mm -hmm. Well, I think our communities, uh, certainly in Berlin, really prefer the smaller class sizes. At the elementary Close and middle well. and high school. Close so. to as well, they share that. Mm -hmm. but I it, think if, you'd have support for that. Anyway. If that's the situation, though, it doesn't look like school choice is an option. <laughs> Well, right. no, what, what it is, Lori, is that, because I've gone back and forth with that, too, um, and actually what it is is we need, we have less school choice students this year. It's more of our own students, and we need those teachers. But once you have those teachers, it does allow us to have the revenue. We're not getting, the, the revenue will help offset the teachers that we actually need. So we were just talking about, we are make sure we're not hiring teachers because we have school choice kids, right? But we don't. When you really look at the numbers, we're hiring teachers because we have our own kids, our own students, that are actually staying in the community, that are staying in their school. But if you can add to that and make the revenue case, Correct. that's a positive that's addition correct. to... Right. And that's what we have to find that balance. Yeah. I just have a question. You know, looking at the budget, obviously we can go in and talk about stuff. But I just saw one here that just jumped out of the maintenance of equipment roof units for like fifteen thousand dollars. Oh yeah, good question. What is that? It's a service contract for all the all of the HVAC equipment up on the roof. That's new. Well, because it was absorbed in the project, right. the building project. It's part of the building project. Okay. They, they automatically, through warranty, et cetera, had serviced, had done the servicing. And the building project can't prepay for like five years or something? <laughs> <laughs> well, then you're going to pay that out for the next 20 years on interest, right? So, you know. Just a five. Okay. So, um, and any other suggestions you have prior to um, the next region meeting, if you have more information that you want us to prepare? The next thing was the cost analysis. Julie, do you have nothing on that? I believe you've all received the cost analysis. Um, it shows what we currently pay for our current lease and then what the river bridge would cost based on the 2560 and the 2700 square feet and the approximate cost, we believe, somewhere between $20 a square foot and $50 a square foot to build it out for our use. So that's in there. And the analysis of what they said they would keep the cost the same for the first um, five years or until our point when our contract would end. And then the analysis showed how much the price would go up in 2022. So it would be about 26.2% increase for the smaller space and 33.6% increase for the larger space at that point. So I also just wanted to let the school committee know I met with um, Nell Lazur. Is that right? Is that how you say your last name? 
think yep. so, right? So um, she has been with the Goff House next door to us, and there is a potential opportunity for us to also explore the, um, the town of Boylston working with um, Fuller Foundation and the Historical Society in trying to get um, that building actually renovated and fixed so we might have the opportunity of actually moving into that facility. Um, uh, Brad is actually going to be joining me um, to meet with them to have a full discussion with all the stakeholders about what is the opportunity, what is the cost factor, what, what would we be looking into. Um, so we also wanted to let you know this is this is definitely one option. It's definitely very appetizing, it's appealing, it's great. The number piece is a little, I don't know, um, <laughs> that's up to you. But uh, we also are exploring another opportunity, which we could just move right next door. Um, I think the other thing you want to think about when, when the school community is looking at options is this is also paying money to a private practice. And by being able to keep it into a town building and something we're actually helping to support our own towns. So it's just something that I just want to give school committee a little bit of caution with. Do you have any indication of what the cost would be to rent there? So to to renovate? That, well, no, to rent the golf house? Um, they haven't said anything about a different change from what we currently okay. have. So would there be a build-out cost associated with that? So that, again, will be all part of that conversation okay. that we'll have that we can, that Brad and I can bring back to the full committee. Um, and meeting, I think, the week of vacation. Because the other thing I would ask that we look at in this analysis, and, and I like this, but I would add to stay in our current location, renovations are needed, yep. right? And we need, so you have build out costs of these other locations, but if we were to make sure we're comparing everything equally, we need to update what we currently have. So if we're to stay there, what are the cost of upgrading? So when we compare the three, we have some consistent numbers. I have a feeling the golf house, because it's historical, will be quite expensive to renovate, having done some historical renovations. However, there may be funds available from other sources to try to do it. So I don't know until we look at it, but I just wanted to point that out. I have a feeling it will be more expensive. Mm -hmm. but, but is that something either the historical committee or the town would absorb, <clears throat> getting that up to uh, the right standard so they could rent it out, right? right. Whether it was us or somebody else, they an investment needs that to take place. Yeah. Somebody else would I don't think we're that. looking to fund renovating a building for them. No. Okay. No. As a matter of fact, what we were talking about is looking at some grant potential grant opportunities, as well as um, some outside sources that might be um, willing to contribute to the renovation because it is a historical building itself. Sure. So there's other uh, organizations that might be willing to support that type of change because then they would see a historical building actually being used to its capacity. That's great. Mm -hmm. Does the school does the um, school system have a mechanism for do we have an educational foundation or something that a foundation can make donations to? Boylston has a Boylston Educational Foundation. Right. Um, that's that's who supports a lot of our classroom um, grants and extra supports that they provide. So that's one item. Um, that is a very small amount, I think, compared to what the renovation itself, but it would be a great con contributor if that's what they would do. Yeah, I was just thinking, because I had a conversation with a foundation about yeah. a different topic we had been discussing. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions was, do you have a fa an educational foundation? Because they can't give money to the school or the school system. It has to be to a foundation. And I knew we had BEF, but I did not know if there was some... No, no BEF. Um, obviously, you have your PTOs, but that's very different than the BEF is the actual educational foundation. Right. But I wonder if part of what was being discussed around this building is the, you know, the historical society mm -hmm. going for grant funding to create the space 
and then the school department leasing yeah. it once it's approved. Yeah. We're hoping to try to find the, the partnership type grants so that we could be writing the grant together to show that we're both schools, towns, and historical society, all three, par all three partners are trying to um, get this building up and running. So there's a few partnership grants that tend, that tend to get more funding if there's more parties trying to collaborate together. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're hoping. Um, so if you were talking about, to Tom's point about renovating or retrofitting your current space, what would be involved with that? The um, yeah. elevator? You need an elevator. Uh -huh. um, you need new carpets. Mm -hmm. You need new uh, windows, actually, are um, quite distraught. We need painting, you know, cosmetically painting. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of pieces there. I mean, some of that, the building itself is owned by the town, so the windows themselves have to be, should be repaired by the town, not from the school system. Um, so, you know, we've been trying to use the windows the best we can, but there, if you were to really look at it, there's a lot of work that actually needs to be done. Those carpets are the same carpets yeah. that they had since they I were guess I would look for it to be similar to what you would fit it out with, not putting an elevator in there, right? That's, that's the landlord's responsibility. Right, that's that's not the, the, the leasee's responsibility, and we need to look at it as just to get that environment up to a professional standard, because mm -hmm. right, it's below par right now. And if we were to look to continue to lease it, like these analysis are showing out through um, 2026, you definitely need to invest a little bit into the surroundings, whether it's the carpet or the paint or um, the furniture or whatever else. Probably not as expensive as fitting out a new space, but there's definitely, I would think, expenses. And the elevator is a problem with the golf house too, right? Well, actually, with the golf house, there is um, there's a ramp access, and we would have a common conference room on that main first floor, I mean, a, a, a conference room in the back of that first room, right by the ramp. They would come in. I walked through that building actually with um, Marty McNamara and Michael May. And we walk through, and there's the ramp on the side. And right now, there is a, um, uh, um, <laughs> but there's a big dumpster that's right outside. And um, I'm using a different term. But there's a big dumpster right outside. That would actually be moved, and that could be a spot for handicap parking. And then you have the ramp. And then they would just come right into the first floor. So we would have offices upstairs, but also conference space on the floor. So it is handicapped accessible where right now, I, mean, I will, I do want to say though that currently if I've had a situation where we've had an open meeting and we've had to use the main area, the police department has been very gracious in giving us their space and it's just a little bit of an inconvenience for them and for us, you know. But I do want to say they've been wonderful in allowing me to use that first floor. Right, so we'll just move on to Diane's report. NASC update, our um, faculty has begun their meetings with their standards committees. We have seven standard committees. These are chaired by uh, faculty members. And the first part of our self-study process was analysis of the Endicott survey that all of our students um, a majority of our parents and 100% of our faculty and staff took as well. So at this point, the standards committees are taking that information, all the, all the data, and going through and trying to determine what strengths and weaknesses we have in each one of those questions that pertain to the standards. And their next steps really are to try and figure out what other research um, or in addition to surveys that they may need to do in order to be able to write their self-studies. So this is being done in faculty meeting time as well as professional development time. 
Um, I did receive reports from each one of the standards committees and their chairs um, after our last professional development day in which they used their afternoon session to work. And um, I'm happy to report that you know all of the committees are well on their way to analyzing all the data and coming up with a plan on how to move forward and get questions answered that um, they, uh, the study Endicott survey had shown um, areas of either weakness or strength and we need to get some evidence to help back those, um, those standard responses up as well. This uh, process will continue all the way through next year. And we do have a schedule in place where each one of the standard committees will be writing their report. The report will then be given to the steering committee um, a month ahead of time to sort of tweak out, see if there are any um, areas that need to be changed. And then each one of the standard committees will present the faculty their reports. And the, there has to be a majority vote for those reports to go forward and become part of um, our self-study. So we have that timeline um, already established, and all of the committees know when the reports are due. And um, I'm very pleased with the progress that they've made so far in such a short period of time. Upcoming events and recognitions. I am pleased to announce that Peter Mackey has been selected to the district recipient's President's Award of Merit on behalf of the Massachusetts Secondary School Athletic Directors Association. And the award is presented to an athletic director who has dedicated their efforts to the profession for many years and having made significant contributions within the field of athletics. And Peter will be presented with the award at the MSS ADA President's Award Luncheon on Wednesday, um, March 25th in Hyannis. Um, so congratulations to Peter. He has um, worked very hard on behalf of Tahanto Athletics for um, a number of, for decades um, and has really built the program up um, to the program that it is today and um, you know I feel very honored and it's kind of like it's about time that he's being recognized for all of his hard work and dedication to um, athletics. And a successful open house was held for the incoming class of 2022 um, on January 14th, 2015. And uh, I calculated it out, not that I'm looking for, forward to this, but um, I believe that this incoming class will be uh, the class that I will be retiring. <laughs> I know, huh? Yeah, I'm kind of that from? What? Where are you I know I look really Wait a minute, that's not on your report. I know, it's not on my, I tried to add it because I was really, really excited as I was doing the calculations. Um, but on Wednesday, um, January 21st, the counseling department um, welcomed Dr. Loretta Holloway, professor from Framingham State, and presented a college readiness program titled What Every Parent Should Know. Um, we had 80 people attend um, this evening, which I think is one of probably our largest parent events um, that I think we've probably held in the history of, um, of Tahanto. And we want to thank the PTO for sponsoring, helping to sponsor the event, as well as um, Lauren Clark and Greg Piccarello for um, their time in organizing the event as well. And I think that the, the speaker did an excellent job, and we are sort of brainstorming on how we can utilize um, her more, especially with the actual students um, coming into the transition years of freshman year. And upcoming events, second semester began on January 26th. And tomorrow morning, uh, the juniors will be presented with the first annual college admissions panel. And we have representatives from Emanuel, UMass, WPI, Worcester State, and Becker College. And they'll be answering questions on topics such as school visits, admissions, senior year course selections, standardized tests and quizzes, um, standardized tests and essays as well. So we look forward to um, this event. And on February 11th, uh, which is next Tuesday at 6.30 in the Tahanto Auditorium, Dr. Englander from the Mark Bullying Prevention Program at Bridgewater State will hold a lecture for parents on bullying and cyber bullying prevention as well as um, social media. And this event will be open to all parents of students in grades K through 12. So a flyer will be going home um, electronically through School Messenger to all parents in grades K through 12. And during February vacation, it's here, 52 students and seven chaperones will be headed to Hawaii. 
Pearl Harbor. Hopefully it doesn't snow <laughs> if they're <laughs> for their vacation. Our last Hawaii trip, they actually, um, we had a large snowstorm and they were delayed in, in being able to leave on their trip. So we're hoping we get all the snow taken care of before um, this group sets out. And the course, uh, the trip students will visit various historical and cultural sites on the island. And activities include uh, the Arizona, Missouri, and Pearl Harbor Military Punch Bowl Cemetery, Dole Plantation, Polynesian, Polynesian Cultural Center, and Hiking Diamond Head Mountain. And um, last but not least, the middle school will hold a semi-formal dance on Friday, February 27th from 7 to 9.30. And our winter ball that was scheduled for last weekend because of the uh, blizzard um, and ticket sales, they decided to move it to this coming weekend. So hopefully we won't have snow and it will be held this Saturday evening uh, beginning at 7 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so the next um, item is the 2015-2016 um, calendar. There is a first read, um, and you have in front of you two calendar options. I want to say that I am, I feel very confident in presenting this, uh, these calendars to you. We have had more input from these calendars than I think we have, since I've been here anyway. Every teacher's association has given comments, suggestions, um, and recommendations. We've been able to bring these to the PTOs, the administration. Um, I believe, did your school council see it, Diane? Yes, yes, yeah, school they councils. Did. So we have really put these calendars out there for feedback um, to bring to you. What is uh, one topic that has come up through all the associations and some of the parents as well was the um, recommendation of the Wednesday before November, um, before Thanksgiving. Typically we don't have school on that Wednesday. We haven't, I think for the last six or seven years, I think it's been, does that sound right, Diane? Carol? Yeah, I think five, yeah, five. Five seven, years or so. Yeah. Um, because what was done was a test, um, there was a survey done at the time, and there was a lot of staff absenteeism, there was a lot of student absenteeism, and so the recommendation was to not have that half day on that Wednesday before, and to uh, just extend the day, um, the day longer. And so the recommendation now, after five years, is people are really trying to see if there's a possibility of having that half day come back on that Wednesday before. So rather than me saying no, 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 because that's not what we've done, so I'll bring it forward to the school committee um, as a suggestion. They did also talk about the Good Friday as well, but I will tell you that that is typically, um, you have a lot of people that are out for religious reasons on a Good Friday. Um, we had the staff PD day that a couple years ago, three years back, because of a stove storm that we had, um, and it did cause some issue where I ended up having to do a half a day um, as well, and then we still have people not able to attend. So that one I wasn't ready to bring forward to you at this time, but my recommendation would be if we'd like to try to do the early release day, we could do a tally of the attendance and give it back to you, and then for the following year, based on that attendance, we can make a decision whether we want to keep that half day as that Wednesday before, or say no, we want to go back to what we've had. So that's a suggestion. Why would we expect anything would change? Right, we, we have data that shows that in the past. You have a different client, you have a different group of people. You know, you have a lot of, maybe not. But so I, I think, think you have all three associations asking for it. And um, asking I'm, it for it to actually be a work day? To asking it to have a half a day that day before rather than not. So rather than me saying no because we haven't done it for the last five years, I said, well, maybe it's time to try it again and do a tally and do it. They know we'll be looking for the attendance on that. We know that this is an option. Um, I mean, it's clearly up to you, but I just didn't want to be the one to say, no, we're not doing it. But just to get the feedback of what school committee thinks on that. So this is just a first read, um, but uh, we made quite a few changes from the initial to this um, final one that you, you know, this 
Looks like we're going back a week early this in this too. We're actually not. We typically go back the last week of August. If you look at where we are this year, we've always gone the last Well typically you go the Wednesday before the break. So, before Labor Day. So, so like Labor last Day year, moves. Yeah. Right? I get but this this past year it was we went back Wednesday before Labor Day. So we went to school Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and then had a three-day weekend. That's true. That's how, that's how it... The last couple of years have been like that's that. That's true. Because of the way the Labor Day, the way the day fell was earlier in the year. But what we're looking at is when do we start in regards to a calendar year, not because of a holiday. So we start on a calendar year, we start that last full week of August. So that's what we did because we started, I think it was August 25th this year. And we're starting August 26th next year. Or I'm off. I'm off by a day. I forget how it goes. But we started that Wednesday, which was the last full Wednesday in August. So we're keeping the calendar when we start. But what that does allow us to do as well, Tom, is it allowed us to move that early release in se into September for a professional uh, development, which we would not be able to do uh, that half that professional development if we were to move it. And the other piece that I need to let you know is that you are not supposed to have school, more than 12 days of school after the graduation day. And that is a mass general law and that was not always followed. And so um, graduation has always been the first Sunday in June. And so if you look at the first Sunday in June of June 5th, uh, this year we were really cutting it close even on this school year. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're already at five, six, seven, you're already at the eighth day as it is. Um, so the later you start in August, the later we're gonna go in June. And I like, mm -hmm. people typically like to, um, not have to go until June 30th, but as a matter of fact, there are some school districts now that have already had five snow days, and they're already going into their June 30th, and they're looking at any more snow days that have going to, they're going to have to eliminate their April vacation. Have you proposed that at all, eliminating April vacation? So that's a great question. Um, three years ago, when I first started here, um, we did a survey to see if we were to take a February vacation, April vacation, and make it a March vacation, maybe somewhere in the middle. And there was quite a significant amount that stated no, they felt that they needed that February vacation because you've got the six weeks, it's a big chunk of time, and it's good to have a break, and then they have a fresh start, and then they have another six weeks. It's a way of breaking it up um, in throughout the school year. So there was a lot of, and I'd be more than happy to give you that information as well. But superintendents are starting to bring that conversation back up again, of course. Whenever we get a lot of snow days like this, we're always like, ah, what are we going to do? And is that an option? So um, it's coming back up. It comes around every couple of years as a discussion. Um, what do, do we gain a whole day if we do a half day on that Wednesday before Thanksgiving? Right. That's why if you look at the two calendars, the one that has the Wednesday as an early release, you get out on June 14th. And the calendar that does not have the Wednesday as an early release, you get out on uh, June 15th instead of the 14th. So it does count as a school day. So it's just a first read. If you have other you know, questions, comments, or what have you before the next meeting, or if you have anything now, I, I actually like trying the having a half day school before Thanksgiving. I'd love to see um, what those absentee rates are on that day as compared to like the Wednesday of the week before, or the Wednesday mm -hmm. after, first week of December, you know, that wintry time of year, what's typical. Sure. Um, and I, I think too for the next time, as far as I can remember having students in school, I feel like we've always pretty regularly started that last Wednesday in August. It would be great to, to see a record of those calendars. I mean, that's because I have heard some concern from the community about, oh, I thought we always started the Wednesday before Labor Day. 
And yes, sometimes that's true, but I, I personally prefer the last Wednesday in August because I, I'd just rather see us getting out earlier in June. I think kids yeah, and families yeah, yeah. are ready to come back at the end of August. They're not ready to learn at the end of June. So it's, you know. Yeah, I think I'd rather if you let out earlier in June. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather take out an April or February vacation, yeah, right? Yeah. Really. Uh, well, I know, me, yeah. And but, I remember that survey. But. but I guess my point of view would be, I think the day before Thanksgiving, whether you have it a half a day or not, families are going to take off that day. and Or not much work is going to get done in school, so it's kind of a wasted day anyway. But then again, days at the end of June are pretty much wasted days anyway, too. Um, yeah, I think that's the reality of it. Mm -hmm. Don't we have a policy that's a lot stricter on kids who miss school um, yeah. as well. Yep, we just and so the for those elementary. kids that decide to skip because their parents say, hey, we gotta go visit somebody, I think they could get penalized if we have school that day. So Yeah, there's so many days they have to meet with the principal and so yeah. forth. So. I don't want to force a penal yeah, penalize for a day that most right. other school districts in the state are off. You know, people are using it as a travel to, to meet up with family and friends. So. Honestly, personally, I'm okay either way. I just didn't want to just say no one. I wanted to bring it to the committee to make that decision because technically the committee makes the calendar, right? I think we so. should try it and get the data and then have the discussion <clears throat> after you have the data. So I think we've all, we have years of data. Mm -hmm. We've got the data. It's not going to change. People's behaviors aren't going to change. We've got a history of it. Look at, look, look at the data we have. But I haven't seen the data. I know, and we can, we can look at it then, because we've got, I'm sure you've got tens of years of data on this thing. I don't think one year will make that decision either way. So at the next regional meeting, it'll be a vote on the calendar. You'll be able to decide which calendar. I'll still bring both calendars present to you so that you can determine. Um, and I will say that um, the other piece that I'm really pleased about is we're able to basically, other than the contractual differences, these calendars pretty much are in sync, the most in sync I think we've ever had. The only month that's off a little bit is October because of different contractual reasons. So we wanted to make sure it was only October that was off and not October and then November, whatever. It's just that one month. That's a little bit different. So, okay. Okay. The next um, item is the approval for the bus bid. So Julie, do you want to talk about that? Okay, so we need approval because we went up for a five-year contract, so we need better pricing for five years. Um, fortunately, we only had two bidders. We had a lot of people take out the packet, but we didn't have a lot of bids. So um, the low bidder was the NTR bus. They were significantly lower than um, the other bidder, and they're only slightly higher than what we're currently paying. So. The package has all the detail of the breakout of the five years. Um, does that have any questions? Or? Just apart from the cost, um, are there performance measures? And can we put performance measures and financial penalties into the contract around performance? Because we've had a lot of issues this year with bus performance, in my opinion. Um, and we did hear at the conference other districts putting financial penalties in for some of the things that we've been experiencing this year. Um, look into that. I'm not exactly sure of the restrictions on that. When you do that, do you put in financial bonuses if they achieve certain performances, or is it only a. I think you said. I, the impression I got, I think you could probably do it however you want to structure it, mm -hmm. pay for performance kind mm -hmm. of approach. Right. But the example that was shared with us, I think, was just performance penalties. There, the expectation was, you win this bid, these are the performance expectations. If you fail to meet them, here are the penalties for failing to meet them. Yeah, so for example, if a bus was late on the route, they would be charged, assessed a fee. I also um, contacted, and I don't know if you were able to get in touch with any of the references. I did talk to a couple of references. And uh, I did three, and they were all good. Positive. I did speak to one particularly who I value his opinion very much, and um, he had 
very positive things uh, to say about NRT as well. Okay. Um, he said, you know, whenever there was anything, oftentimes, you know, sometimes you find out because a parent's contacting you first. In more cases than not, he's found out because they've contacted him directly. You know, before a parent gets to you, this is what, you know, more to know or what have you. So um, they've been very, uh, they were very pleased. And he said, I rarely talk to the bus company, and if you don't have to talk to them, that's a good sign. He said, very rarely has he had to have a conversation with the bus company. Much. One of the people I called basically said, well, we never deal with them, so I guess that's good. And the other district had done a complete um, redistricting of the entire town and said that they were really good to work with because they'd had, that was a huge undertaking and they had to work with them and they were nothing but rave reviews of them, so. Okay. One of the things we had talked about was the issue of communication. Is that somehow built in, that there'll be some? So, yep, so there is an additional, is it, not, is it in here, that um, GPS? You're talking about the GPS line? I'm not sure if that's exactly what you and I had talked about the fact that one of the issues this year has been the bus has at times been so erratic. Kids go outside, they wait 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Oh my God, I must have missed the bus. So they come back in and then parents are trying to make, scramble to make plans and then the bus goes by. <laughs> So, so it's not know. knowing where is the bus or getting some communication that says the bus is going to be delayed today or this particular bus is delayed. Do you know to put in um, for pricing to have a GPS tracker so people can track the buses on, with, on their phones with an app? Um, and they, so they gave them the pricing for that, so we're adding that into the budget for next year. You can track where your bus is. You know when it's two minutes away, five minutes away, broken down, not moving. You have all that as a parent. So you won't have to speed home anymore. <laughs> you, can want, you can follow it. <coughs> calling your neighbor. Yeah. Did the bus yeah. come? I do have a question about the business. It says that eight buses for 180 days per year. But we have 182 yep. days. Yep. So is it the same price or the price? Yeah, they, so they do also price it out by day. Okay. So and they, then, did, they did have to give it both ways. So yes, that was an error, but somewhere else in the bid it's at 182, okay. so we've just added that. And then it says one best bus for 183 days for ASPA, which brings up the whole question about ASPA. How many students do we have going to ASPA? Roughly, approximately, like 25, 20? Mm -hmm. So next year, it'll yeah. be 20. 20. But yet a bus fits a lot more than that. Are we going to be able to share that bus with anybody and share some costs or get a smaller bus? Or is we getting a big bus and you're just going to have an empty bus. Do you want to answer anyone too? I've contacted, um, like West Boylston was one that we had looked at previously, mm -hmm. and they have so many kids that they said they can't share a bus with us. Right. That's and what happened so originally. That's your best route to go with, uh, best town to go with, because to share a bus and then the laws of how long somebody can be on the bus that's pretty much your only option for that. So in regards to a smaller bus, Julie can find out what that bus actually is. The rules say that too this big, too this many kids is for a small, smaller bus. Right, but we can we can look at some of those because I know there's. A, I just think it's worth. We have the flexibility now to, yeah. to look at whatever we could possibly do to, to save money on that. Right. I will say though that this is a 4.9 percent decrease. 4.6. From what we budgeted, but from what we budgeted um, for a um, couple dollars per bus, more expensive for the regular routes, and it's actually slightly um, cheaper for the asset bit route right. than our it's current right. contract. That's well, I agree. Yes. I just like to save but money. That was, yeah. From the budget, though, we're up a little bit from this yep. year, but from what we budgeted, it was. I'm talking about just the asset bit bus itself. Oh, is a decrease from the current. Yeah, we're currently. I think it's a 4.9 or 4.6 percent decrease. In we're currently current. paying 269.50 per day versus 250 right. last year. So it's. And how many students do we have this year? Asset. Uh, I believe we have. 18, maybe 14. Is it four or less or something? So we have seven from Boylston this year that have applied. We have four from Boylston that are graduating. So we're up to 20, so you have about 17, 18. And we're mandated to cover the cost of that bus if ASABIT doesn't have to share any of those costs. 
parents cannot pay. This isn't actually part of our budget, though Boylston pays it. We just go through. They we go through the bid with us. Them. So this isn't actually in our budget. It's in the town of Boylston's budget, not the region's budget. Yeah. <coughs> Does it that. figure so into our school budget so overall? No, not the as of that piece. So, okay. Lori, if you look at your town report, like for town yep. meeting, and you look at the spreadsheet, you will see as of transportation, and that's a separate line. So that's all from the town side. Okay. It's part of our big picture of our here's your here's your assessment school number. right your assessment number here's your school here's a school lines. different percentage and the town meeting but that's separated out from our our regional budget and our uh, elementary budget okay. <coughs> as is the alphabet tuition is also separate. I think it's just worth talking to the big company and seeing if they have a smaller bus that fits like twenty to twenty five. Because if we can save some money on this, I think it's well worth it, even mm -hmm. if the bid is less than, than sure. last year. It's the one chance we have to do something. And I know it doesn't affect Berlin that much, but when you go in for the assessment of Boyles, then you see Boyles and Elementary, Regional Assessment, Asset Charge, Asset Plus Charge. It's one of those four numbers that comes up at town meeting. And I think we should try to reduce that if we can. So we need a motion to are we not interested in any kind of performance measures or in the contract? I guess I'm not sure the rules are on what we can change in the contract. We still have to work with the contract. So we'd have to look and see what the, what the rules would be to change We would have had to bid it that way, right? Yeah. We'd have to put it out to bid that way. So, if we wanted so would we have to re-bid that? Do you know? Say how they did it yeah. in the other places. I don't know. Well, I think it's part of the bid language, Lori. No, I, I didn't because I didn't have any. I think that was part of the bid language. That's maybe the learning for next time is mm -hmm. to include. That. How often do we do the bus contract? Every five years. Five years. So we wait five years now to. Okay. It is what it is. It doesn't hurt to ask. I mean, you could certainly say, we can hey, we we're happy to work with you. Can you throw in the GPS tracking for free? It oh, doesn't hurt to ask some of these things. We'll check the legalities of what we can do based on the bidding so that we're not doing anything outside of that. We'll, you can call, right. call Ross Dupre and ask his advice on our attorney. Okay, okay. so uh, I guess we need to vote on accepting this bid. Uh, we have a motion and a second, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, all those in favor of accepting the bid for the uh, bus from NRT bus? I don't think we made the motion. We didn't make a motion yet? Mm -hmm. Okay, do I hear a motion? To approve so moved. Motion? Is there a second? I second it. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, and then, um, other pieces, um, Spain, the Spain trip. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yes. Um, sorry for the last minute notice, but um, on behalf of Sadie Brzezinski, who is our new uh, language teacher, she teaches um, Latin in sixth grade as well as Spanish in seventh and eighth grade and two sections of Spanish one for the high school. Um, she has asked, um, she would like to take a trip in the spring of 2016, a group of students to Spain. Um, and she would like to do this through EF Tours, um, who we have worked with in the past, who also does our trips to France as well. Um, she had done some research. Um, it would cost approximately anywhere from $2,600 to $2,900 um, for the trip. The trip would include um, a pretty neat cultural aspect where the students would actually a group of students would actually spend time in um, a family's home sharing a meal with them, um, whether it be lunch or dinner. Um, and we thought this was really kind of a, a, kind of a neat experience that I don't think any other trip that we've had um, had been able to do that as well. So um, Sadie Brzezinski would like to ask for approval 
to um, begin having information and sign-ups for a trip to Spain um, in the spring of 2016. And the itinerary, um, you know, as soon as we receive it from um, EF Tours, I would actually have Sadie herself come in. Um, the reason why we're pushing it along quickly is that um, if we, if students sign up prior to the end of February, they'll receive a hundred dollar discount um, on the fee per student. So that's why we want to try to save as much money as possible. Yeah. It, it, has she filled out the form for the overnight field trip? No. Okay. I guess I don't feel comfortable proceeding until that step is taken care of so we have what we're voting on documented and in front of us. I, I'm well supportive of this. I just don't want to rush it without the right due diligence that we typically take for these. Right, I think we would be taking it and bringing it to you for that first March 3rd meeting. The only piece that we're asking is that Diane had asked if I would approve the letter and then we would get you all the paperwork afterwards and I said, I don't feel comfortable signing the letter approving it unless the school committee is aware this trip's coming forward and if the school committee would even, you know, I don't know, maybe even have the school committee approve um, that proposal of that letter. Yeah. So EF Taurus has worked with schools um, who run into the same issue. The timing of school committee meetings doesn't line up with, you know, the timing of, um, you know, the teacher receiving information as well as being able to take advantage of a discount. So EF Taurus has forwarded a letter to us basically stating that it would honor the discount um, for our students and if it came time for um, the March meeting where the school committee, you know, would either approve or not approve, that if the school committee did decide not to approve the trip, that the students would receive 100% um, of reimbursement of any money that they have paid in their initial deposit, as well as the $95 deposit the school would make. I'm just not comfortable with going that far until we have done mm -hmm. our own due diligence with, we have this certain process in place that we follow that before it even goes out. Can we do that via email and we get the, we get this filled out tomorrow? We can, but then we wouldn't have school committee vote, right? And Didn't we do this one other field trip via kind of a email type of approval? I, s I see what you're saying. I get what you mean. Yeah. So I just want to see. I all, want to see what we're approving. You can all tenant, right? You can all verbally, um, individually approve it to me, and then it officially gets approved at the school committee meeting at the next meeting. But at least they. I just didn't feel comfortable yeah. saying to Diane, "Sure, have the kids get the and then have them get their hopes up, and then the school committee doesn't vote for the, for the trip, right? Because then that doesn't look good either." So I see what you're saying. I have the same reservations without right. seeing it all. Oh, maybe I'm the right. only one no, who shares it. I, I, just... yep, I was fine. just curious, what, is there some piece of information that is not known, which is why we couldn't have seen the form? No, it's just last minute. We just no, got it, it, it was, you know, we basically, you know, um, Sadie had to see, had to take some time to see if there was enough student interest even for her to go ahead and pursue the work with EF Tours. So she, there was enough interest, and then EF Tours just got back to her, I think it was Thursday or Friday. And um, of course we had the storm, and EF Tours said, you know, listen, we're running a special, if you can get it, um, you know, if we can do the sign-ups by the end of February, we'll take off $100. So really the, the purpose of rushing it is to try to save the families um, a little bit of money so that really is the only reason but the form that i recall us seeing isn't very complicated i mean it couldn't have been filled out today you know what no it actually is very it's yeah. like very very it's pages that, yeah. that we have oh, to not that we see correct right. Different. Yeah. okay because what we see is pretty simple yeah and ours wouldn't is several be, pages several hard. pages long have things that they have to have on the line and before Diane signs yeah. it, and then before I sign it, and then you see the paper, and then you get the overall. But you don't see all the stacks of documentation to make them get. 
So she's looking at spring break then? You say April. April, 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 April. April. Okay. But, okay, so what we'll do then is tomorrow, Diane, okay. if you can have that filled out, mm -hmm. I'll send it to individually. And then uh, if you could just be very quickly those do the return so that we give the students enough time to be able to sign up for it if you guys approve it and we'll do the official vote at the next meeting. Sound good? Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us of that strategy, Tom. That totally okay. That's what we did before that works out. Okay, so next on the agenda school committee comments. Any comments from the school committee? I was, oh. no, I was going to say for future agenda items. So. Kind of a future agenda item, actually. Uh, we had talked last year about maybe in, I think it was February this month, which is passed, about maybe having an update on the athletic funds. And I think on the budget we saw the incoming or the expenditure. So it would be, we were going to look at the percentage of um, what the students are paying in fees of the overall cost of the athletics. And also my other question is, do we, are we any closer to maybe a stabilization fund or something like that for the track and field that we can so put money into? It's funny you bring that, that up because I had said that to, with Diane, it's on a February piece. When she spoke to Peter Mackey, Peter had asked if we wait a little bit longer because he wanted, he'll have a better understanding once he gets all the spring Registrations. Mm -hmm. registrations coming in, then you'll have a better measure okay. of where we are with all of that, and then and where we are with that money to help with the um, track. We'll see what we did after the first year, and uh, that'll give us a better understanding. But yeah, I had in my notes too for February, so because um, we'd be able to see if raising the fees uh, reduced the amount of participation or or right. how, how it helped. That'd be great. Right. So we just have to wait until after the spring registration before we yeah. actually get it. That's fine. When is it? Is that coming up shortly? That comes it's, up. Um, it's the spring sports, I think, could officially begin the third Monday in <coughs> March. Okay. So you're probably looking probably the first, the very end of February, first week of March will be sign-ups. Okay. Snow's going to melt, though. <laughs> 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 oh, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> I just have two, spring sport. two quick comments that I wanted to just um, bring up. First of all, I think you could see as part of the school committee goals, but also as part of the administration goals, we have really looked at um, um, socials, uh, social um, communication was really a big goal and it's a big mission for us. And I just wanted to make a comment that in my observations this year, we have got an extensive communication, I think, as a whole. We've done a great job at really bringing a lot of um, community parents and so forth involvement in our schools, even more so, right from our STEM advisory group that we have, our parents' night that we had for literacy, the ALICE training that we've had. Diane just spoke tonight yet again on, on the other events that we had for um, what every parent should know. And I just want to say that I, I think we're all really reaching towards that goal of building that social communication. And I think everybody's really um, been doing a lot of work on that, and I think it shows. So I, I just wanted to bring that up. That, that is a goal, it's an important goal for all of us. And um, it doesn't all happen in one year or in one day. We're definitely seeing an improvement in that, in that area. Um, the other piece I just wanted to bring home to the school committee is I wanted to inform you that um, um, poor Diane had my, had a, I had her ear this afternoon as I was talking, that I wanted to bring forward to the school committee as well and, and publicly. Um, I will be inviting um, the associations. I meet with all of them. I was supposed to meet with uh, the Tahanto group uh, yesterday, but I am, um, which we'll be rescheduling as well. But. You know, when I first started here, and I remember my first interview with, with Ken, <clears throat> one of the big pieces, and, and it became the, the headline of the, of the piece of the interview, was my passion for education. And, um, you know, I got into education because I have a very strong passion for our future. And, and children are truly our future, and how we can nurture, and how we can help and support. And I have really been doing a lot of reflection. I don't know if it's because of our snow days and, and so forth, but um, 
I feel that spark of passion for education has really dwindled. Um, and it's been bothering me because I, I that's not what I, I get into education because I, I love my job. I love what I do. I love what we do. Um, and that spark has really been dwindling. And I've been listening to teachers with that same spark that's escaping. And why is that? <clears throat> and um, a lot of it has to do with our initiatives. And all of these initiatives that are coming so top down and so top heavy that I think we're all really feeling quite squished. And um, we're feeling quite degraded, I think, in many ways. Um, I agree with the accountability. I believe that there are things that we have to do for accountability. But I am going to be inviting the association to join me in writing a letter uh, to the commissioner. Um, because there's, there's one initiative that has really been bothering me quite a bit. And it's hard for me to have to stand in front where honesty and trust and truthfulness is so important to me. It bothers me to try to sit in front of teachers and push an initiative that I really do not uh, believe in. And I feel I'm finally at that tipping point. I need to find my spark and my passion again. And the way to do that is to feel I'm doing the right thing by really pushing um, and, and talking with the association and inviting them to write a letter with me together about the initiatives about our DDMs. I do not think that DDMs are not valuable. I think they are a great tool. I think that they are a great tool to be used in a variety of ways, depending on the authenticity of, of the development of the DDM. But myself as a former SPED director, myself as a former special ed teacher, and having done three area evals, initial evals, and looking at evals, when we look at what used to be called the core evals, of our children to identify special whether they have special needs. It's not on one test. It's a variety. It's a whole group of things that we look at to determine. To take one assessment of a DDM and do that assessment two or three times in the course of the year, <coughs> and then to tell a teacher your value of whether you are proficient or um, needs improvement or unsatisfactory is based on a DDM and the growth of two points of two days, I think we are degrading the profession of education. I think we are doing our students a disservice. And then to take the evaluation and to submit it to the Department of Education and then have it blasted in the newspapers. And those, act, those reports that we had were not even accurate reports, but we weren't the only district. And if you have teachers that are 14 teachers or 16 teachers and you have one that shows is unsatisfactory and needs improvement and I, we all know who that one teacher is when it's a small school system. I think it's it, we're bordering, I have a concern with even civil rights issues there. And I really, really have an issue with the Department of Education getting the reports of our teachers of, of where they stand and how that impacts us in public life. It just bothers me. And I'm not saying it for myself, I'm saying it with my teachers, and I think we have outstanding teachers in our district. I think Tom even said it to you the other day. I feel we have outstanding teachers in our district. I think that they work so hard in providing the best education. We have had our Tejanto school has been noted as being the top and the rank and all this in, in, in a variety of areas. We have um, teachers that have done outstanding work beyond what we could ever think of doing in developing a DDM. Um, I just don't think we fit in a box that we are boilerplating what we need to do for education. I think we have to look at what our students need, what is our environment, what's our culture. And, and I'm going to be asking the teachers to support me and to write. I think if we write as a partnership with administration and um, their associations, I think it will have a bigger weight. So I just want to let you know that's my passion, and I feel that I'm feeling stifled myself because I don't believe in what we're asking our teachers to do, and it's bothering me and it's weighing me down. So I just wanted to let you know that that's coming forward. Um, I really appreciate that. I appreciate hearing that. Um, I think it's you know, we've all been frustrated at the number of things 
number of new initiatives and it, I think as a school committee we struggle a little bit to figure out what's mandated and what's not mandated and but certainly we hear from teachers and their frustrations too. One of the observations I made, it's interesting that you bring up the, the way that the DDM stuff was presented in the newspaper is probably the least helpful thing mm -hmm. you could do with something brand new. Mm -hmm. um, but what I observed is that if you look, you could almost see school to school, district to district, there was wide variety in how those scores were approached. Because you could see in some schools, some districts, there'd be nobody who needed improvement, and in others there'd be a big number who needed improvement. And you just had to think, everybody isn't doing this. It's not an exact science. Everybody's not following the same, uh, necessarily the same template. So I, I had concerns about that when I saw it in the paper. So I applaud you for Thank you. being thoughtful. Thank you. That's my, that's my story and I'm sticking to it, so. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments, future agenda items? Hearing none, I don't believe we have need for executive session, yeah. correct? Do I hear a motion to close? Moved. Second, second that. All those in favor say aye. 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 aye.